All right, well, welcome everybody. Hi, I'm Jonathan Ward, and uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm a uh, semi-retired management consultant. I do some work at the Center for Creative Leadership. And uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed uh, doing throughout my life was getting to know more about the United States Space Program. Uh, I was telling uh, Paul before we started here that actually my very first vehicle that I ever drove was a Boeing vehicle. I drove a Lunar Rover before I was old enough to drive a car. <laughs> I was a guy at the Smithsonian and got a chance to uh, drive a little demo vehicle around the mall back when I was in high school, back during the Apollo 15 mission. So I, I followed the space program a lot ever since I was a kid. I did work, from Bo work for Boeing on the Space Station Freedom Program, but my real love was the Apollo program. And so uh, in researching a couple of books that just came out last year, I uh, wanted to share with you some of the things that we found out about what really happened behind the scenes at Kennedy Space Center. I talked to about 80 different uh, hands from the uh, Apollo era, and uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to see some of the things that, that the public maybe didn't know quite so much about. Uh, one of the things to, to think about with, with the program is, again, with Werner von Braun from uh, his, his team here at, uh, at Marshall, went down to the Cape and they had their very first launch on January, excuse me, July 24th, 1950 of this uh, V2 with a, with a WEC uh, Corporal uh, second stage here. And in the course of about 10 years, the Cape was expanded to the extent now that we have, this was launch complex 34 in 1962. So in only 11 years, we went from that first launch to suddenly now having what was the largest um, uh, space complex in the, uh, in the free world. And one of the things I wanted to give you a feel for that's very different in the, in the old days than it is now is the pace at which things happen and which, uh, some of which was due to being able to cut a few corners here and there. We'll talk a little bit about, about that. Here we've got 1962. This is just after President Kennedy issued his, uh, his challenge to go to the moon. And in the course of the next couple of years, actually within, uh, starting in 1961, uh, NASA acquired <coughs> All of that area in white there, what it was in green was what originally had been the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. NASA acquired all of that area on Merritt Island and got uh, got government approval to use use it and start building on it, all within the course of about six to nine months. So this, this whole area in white was was acquired and they started the what became one of the largest peacetime civil engineering projects ever done. Was something on the scale of the Panama Canal. Uh, was building out Kennedy Space Center. Uh, one of the, the guys from Marshall who I talked to who had gone down to Kennedy said that it took longer for him working on the space shuttle program to be able to get a concrete pad to put a generator on than it took NASA to buy all that land in Merritt Island to build out Kennedy Space Center. <laughs> so, I mean, what you, get, you think about all the facilities that were designed and built as the Apollo and Saturn were being designed and built. This was all the Launch Complex 39 area. You had the BAB, the launch control center, the crawler way, the launch pads, mobile service structure, all of this was being designed and built as the rocket was being designed and built over the course of just a couple of years. Here's the VAB in September of 1964 going up. This is uh, launch, launch complex 39A, this is pad A, uh, which is at this point just a, pad, a pile of dirt which is compacting down the base of the, uh, the, base of the, of the, uh, the pad. Part of the, crawl, the crawler tractor, that's being acquired, You're building out three of these mobile launchers, which are still being used now. I know one of them will be used for uh, for uh, SLS. Uh, this mobile service structure on the right here was something that was designed and built. So, uh, so here we are now. This is set, this is September of 1965. We're only four and a half years now after the president issued his challenge to go to the moon. You've got a Saturn V facility vehicle sitting on the launch pad being tested out. So in the course of four and a half years, designing and building, acquiring uh, all of the facilities and infrastructure necessary to get a Saturn V ready to take off. Just an incredible uh, pace of things happening. Uh, you know, with, with the launches that were going on, we had in 1965, we had one unmanned Gemini, five manned Gemini's, three unmanned Saturn 1B's, or Saturn 1's, two pad abort tests. In 1966, five manned Gemini's, Three uh, Saturn V's, two more, or one more pad abort test, and building a Saturn V facility vehicle. 1967 started off with the Apollo 1 fire, but by the uh, by November we were launching a Saturn V, and meanwhile also sending all the surveyors and lunar orbiters to the moon to check out the sites for Apollo. 1968 we had the first flight of the lunar module, the first manned Apollo mission, one more unmanned mission, and then the, the flight to the moon on Apollo 8. And so things moved very very rapidly. 1969, we had four manned Saturn Vs. Uh, 
the, everything was being pushed to try to get the launch done, obviously, by the end of the decade, by 1969. Apollo 1 was scheduled for July of 69. If they hadn't been successful, Apollo, 11, Apollo 12 was going to go in September of 69. If that wasn't successful, Apollo 13 was stacked and ready to go in December of 1969. So just an incredible pace of trying to get these things going. You had three missions in flow at the same time, most of the time during that 1968-1969 time frame. And here's how it was done. It was done on chalkboards. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, maintaining the schedule for AS-201, the first uh, Saturn 1B launch. Uh, they graduated from taking pictures of the chalkboards, taking those to be developed and then printed out as the schedules, to having now magnetic boards in the mic rooms. Uh, for a while there, they were putting the magnetic boards, uh, portable boards, which they were then taking to reproduction and getting copied overnight and then passing out as the uh, uh, as the scheduling was done. And so you saw, you know, you get cartoons that came out, people moving pucks around all the time. It was, it was a constant battle with uh, maintaining the schedule. In the, uh, the launch control center, these are the four firing rooms, and you can see on the one on the far right, they dedicated the one on the far right to being a micro. It was a giant uh, management information and control uh, room that was made, uh, managed by Boeing with their technical integration and evaluation contract. The, the top half of the room was a big presentation room that looked like this, where they kept the level A and B PERT charts. This was the first time PERT charting had been used outside of the military for the Polaris missile. Uh, they used PERT charts to, to man manage the build out of the facility and also the, uh, the first facility's vehicle. And behind all of this, there is um, the, the entire rest of the uh, uh, firing room is taken up with about uh, 40,000 different levels of uh, 40,000 different schedules that are being tracked by Boeing and the various contractors. All done manually. None of this was, was computerized. And so it's just amazing to me to think about how all of this came together with, uh, with the manual process. Here's an example of just of one of the types of charts that was used for uh, uh, the system's uh, fault isolation on the electrical ground support equipment. Again, maintained manually there and there. So I talk a little bit about the uh, the Saturn V and uh, how how the processing went for a typical Saturn mission. We got the spacecraft on the left, the launch vehicle on the right, and uh, we got the uh, the space vehicle in the center. We're going to talk about the the spacecraft first. The, the um, Processing time for both of these was about six months. From the time the stages got to Kennedy Space Center, it was about six months of assembly, integration, and testing before a launch. And again, we had several transitions in flow at the same time. For Apollo 11, everything showed up at the Cape about in the uh, beginning of January 1969 for a planned launch in July. So here's how things got to uh, the Cape. Uh, the Super Guppy, which is still being used, it's modified now. The spacecraft came in on the uh, Super Guppy. Uh, here's part of the lunar module box uh, created in. Uh, here's the uh, command module and the, uh, the uh, left and the circuit module in the back for Apollo 9. They, so they came off the Super Guppy at the skid strip on the Cape and were taken, off, taken over to the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building, which is now called the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. Um, this was a, another building that was built uh, exclusively for the Apollo program, and it's now being used for Orion. Uh, the Orion uh, test area right now is where it says a limb hold up and test just to the right of center is where the Orion is being assembled right now. Uh, this building was designed before we even knew what the Apollo command sort of module was going to look like. I talked to the engineer that was in charge of developing the high bay for this, and he said, but I had to figure out how big the facilities had to be Said, I got three guys to lie down on the floor. We measured across how far across they were and allowed a little extra room for how wide the spacecraft was probably going to be. We didn't know at that point that they were going to be doing anything other than a direct lunar landing without having a lunar module. So we had, so I had no idea how tall this was going to be. I thought we were going to have some sort of 20 foot tall landing stage that we'd land the command and service module on. So we built them the high bay to allow for that. And of course, in, in the course of the design, you find out we're going to be doing a, uh, a two-stage landing. He said, well, maybe we don't need the high bay anymore after all. You try to get NASA to cancel building the high bay. And they said, no, what you don't understand. It's harder, more expensive to cancel something <laughs> started than it is to go ahead and keep building it out. And it turned out to be just the right height that they needed for the combined maintenance service. <laughs> but uh, the lunar module came in through the left-hand side here. It was inspected and tested. 
The command module came in through the right hand side, and you'll see that the two circular altitude chambers up near the top there, they had uh, altitude chambers that were about uh, 30, 30 feet tall. So these altitude chambers were designed to be able to simulate up to about 200,000 feet in altitude. 250,000 feet in altitude is the vacuum level at that level. They're still in place at, uh, in the operations and checkout building, but they're not being used right now. But they were, uh, this is where the, the buildup was done. It was a convenient place to be able to test out some of the systems. Uh, the command and service modules were done in the right hand one of those, which is actually called the left chamber as, you, as you're looking out from the, uh, the test area. But here's Apollo 11 uh, on, the, on the left hand side, on, uh, being hanging from the crane. That's coming out of one of the altitude chambers after having been assembled and tested. Apollo 12 is on the floor here, getting ready to go into the altitude chamber. We had a couple missions in process at the same time. While this is going on, Apollo 10 was being stacked in the vehicle assembly building, and Apollo 9 was out of the launch pad. So there was a lot going on in those days. Um, here's uh, the Apollo 17 uh, command module going into the uh, altitude chamber. You can see on the far right, you'll see the lid of the altitude chamber sitting up on a bunch of support posts there. It was picked up with a crane and set on the support posts. Uh, it was not attached to the altitude chamber when they when they sucked the air out. It was just sitting on there by the weight of the, of the lid. There was some concern if they had to do a rapid repressurization, would it blow the lid off? This 22-ton lid would it blow that off the altitude chamber. And they said they did a test, and it turned out it just kind of wobbled a little bit. <laughs> so uh, again, the type of testing that was done. Uh, the command module here is covered actually in, in, in silver reflective tape that's got blue. Um, it's got a blue plastic coating on top of it, so it actually looked blue until it got out of the launch pad. And here's, uh, so they would they would lower the service module in, then they lower and make the uh, command module to it. Here they are getting ready to do an altitude run. Uh, see there's convenient work platforms around the command module and the astronauts are about to get in here. They could depressurize, simulate a mission, arrive, uh, they could, they could simulate a return back from space. They couldn't really do, they couldn't depressurize fast enough to take it up into, uh, to do a real-time simulation of going up into a launch so they could, depressurize, they could repressurize uh, enough to simulate coming back. Uh, the, the do's and don'ts for the crew compartment up here in terms of making sure you didn't have things in your pockets as you went in. Uh, even though it was a, a somewhat sterile environment, they still had uh, opportunities for things to get in. Uh, <coughs> Uh, for the Apollo 12 mission, uh, a cockroach got in there. They found actually some legs of one of the, the big Florida cockroaches. Uh, they they duly taped the legs to a discrepancy report so they were not able to find the rest of the roach. Uh, and then on, on the way back from the moon, uh, Commander Pete Conrad held up a card which had what appeared to be a roach body taped to it. He had taken a rubber roach up there with him. <laughs> 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 Uh, here's the lunar module as it's uh, arriving and, and getting ready for testing. Again, everything was done, you know, the lunar module was put together in Beth Page, New York, uh, on Long Island. One of the things that they, they did not have altitude chambers at, uh, at Beth Page, so they were not able to simulate uh, the, the, the uh, vacuum environment in which the lunar module was going to operate. So a lot of, mis a lot of errors were found in the lunar modules when they first arrived in Page especially the early ones, they found a lot of systems that broke down when they when they tried depressurizing. They ended up having to strip down a lot of the lunar modules and actually rebuild them there on the floor uh, in the operations and checkout building. Uh, Fred Hayes was telling me, the astronaut was telling me that uh, the cabin fan inside the lunar module was built to operate at 5 PSI, not 16 PSI, and so it would burn out if you let it run for too long. So they had to log how long the fan was running, things like that. Uh, here's the, the, the top of the lunar module being inverted and now lowered into the altitude chamber to, for a mating test with the command module. So you've got the lunar module on top, command module on the bottom. This is the first time the two spacecraft have met each other. And the next time they do, they do this will be on the way to the moon, so they want to make sure they get it right here in the altitude chamber. So they would practice, they do a docking test, make sure the targets were aligned, make sure they could take out the, the docking mechanism and put it back in place again. 
uh, and, and here's Fred Hayes and, and a, a pilot from, from Grumman. Again, some of the systems they couldn't test until they actually depressurized the chamber for a while and then could get into the uh, system. Uh, Hayes told me that, for, that some of the tests they had to do, they even just basically stood around inside the altitude chamber with no spacecraft in there, but just hooked up uh, in vacuum, staying there in their space, uh, just testing out some of the, the spacecraft connections, uh, space connections. So here they are just standing in the altitude chamber with, connected to arrows and uh, spacecraft. So this is uh, the lunar module as it's being being assembled. It's come out of the altitude chamber now, and you can see there's still a lot of work to be done on it. The, uh, the whole uh, equipment bay at the back end of the, the top half of it is still exposed. That's where all the batteries and hopefully the electronics are. Uh, a lot of that insulation, the, the uh, mylar insulation, was not added until it got after the launch pad. Uh, let's see. Here's uh, I'm testing the lunar rover, which is sitting up on blocks because again, the, the tires are made out of wire and cannot support the weight of the lunar rover on Earth. And so it's sitting up on chocks here as they're testing it out, testing out the communications between the lunar rover and the, uh, the lunar module. And you can see there's still a lot of exposed area on the back of the lunar module. There. So the lunar module, once it's finally assembled and uh, got the legs on, they would put the legs on it, test those out, gets lowered into what was called the spacecraft and lunar module adapter. And so you can see it's being lowered in here very carefully. The tolerances are very, very tight. Uh, here's uh, a picture that I'd never seen published before. But this is the back end of the lunar module as it's, as it's sitting in the, uh, the spacecraft and lunar module adapter. And you can see it's, it's right up against the side of that adapter, of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, the fairing here. And again, all of that exposed electronics in the back all got covered up by the time I went out to the when it went out to the launch. Here's the, uh, the the adapter being placed over the top of it. Then the command module, after its engine bell had been attached, command and service module and the uh, high gain had been attached, gets lowered on top of that. And we have the mated spacecraft, which has been wheeled over on the back of the truck to the uh, vehicle assembly building. So that covered the life of the spacecraft as, a, as an independent unit being tested out. Going over to the VAB now, um, this is the VAB in the Launch Control Center. This is around the bicentennial time, as you can see from the, the, uh, the bicentennial emblem on the side of the building there. Uh, here's a cutaway of operations in the VAB. Again, it was, it was built to be able to handle four, uh, four vehicles being stacked at the same time. They had one firing room dedicated to every of one of the high bays. Actually, the firing rooms were dedicated to mobile launchers, which were then going to be in various high bays. Uh, originally, the, the thought was, before they knew how they were going to get to the moon, they were thinking they may, might need as many as 50 launches a year to be able to get to the moon by, by the end of the 1960s. Uh, that you, we'd have to have multiple launches to get the, uh, the landing craft into orbit and the fuel module up to orbit for it, things like that. So uh, they built with excess capacity uh, even originally planning on four launch pads, by the time they started building out, realizing they only needed two of those. They actually only ended up using three of the high bays, one of them was being used for storage. And uh, so the, uh, the, the uh, various stages came in on barges. Here's the, the uh, Rockwell S2 stage, the second stage coming in. Uh, wheeled from the turning basin over to the vehicle assembly building. Uh, I, Heard a story from the guy who was the lead engineer on the on the S2 stage here that uh, as they were preparing to stand one of the stages up, they heard a strange noise coming from inside the uh, stage and uh, ended up doing a confined entry into the fuel tank and uh, one of the propellant tanks and found a hand tool inside one of the propellant tanks, which uh, caused them to do what he what he called from then on they did what they called the tinkle test, which was to turn the uh, the stage around after it arrived to make sure there were no sounds coming from inside before they started stacking it. So here's uh, once they got into the VAB, you had a uh, third stage checkout was on the bottom on the right hand side uh, in the uh, low bay area. The uh, uh, second stage checkout was on the upper right. The Boeing first stage, Saturn uh, 1C stage, came straight into the sanctuary island and was immediately stacked onto the launcher. But you can see all of the all of the high bays uh, except for high bay four were being used at one time or another during the Apollo program. 
Here's uh, one of the, the checkout cells with uh, some of the work platforms we're kind of this is an export <coughs> stage. Uh, ballast tank, which is still in use there, they filled this with water and used this. Uh, this is what I hooked up right now to a 175 ton crane. This was used for, for crane operator certification. And uh, the cranes were entirely manual. There was no computerized control of the cranes back when they started this up. So you had a guy on the bottom with a radio and the crane operator at the very top of the DAV. We trained the guys, according to the person who designed this, said to be able to set it down on top of an egg where you could not pull the egg out if you didn't crack the shell. <laughs> or also to be able to low, raise and lower it to be able to operate a spray gun hand. I got from a guy who's 400 feet up in the air being uh, told about what's going on. So pretty good tolerances. Now, of course, everything's computerized and, and it's uh, to get some of that excitement out of the process, there, but they're still using that ballast tank. Uh, here's the Boeing uh, S1C stage arriving. You can see uh, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on it. The, uh, the engine uh, nozzles of extensions have not been put on, the fins are not on. So this is the way it arrived after coming from the uh, Micho assembly facility. All of the stages were tested at Marshall. They, they did individual engine, engine testing and then full up. Uh, stage testing before it, it went to the Cape. So everything had been fired through a complete life cycle of the, uh, of the expected engine uh, by the time it got to the Cape. Here's the, uh, one of the stages being taken into the high bay. Uh, here's a picture taken by a friend of mine. Uh, you see a guy working inside the engine department there. They, they did you know, a lot of work uh, inside the uh, the VAB to test out everything, even even though the engines had already been test fired, the, the launch vehicle was in a lot better shape by the time it got to the Cape than the spacecraft was. It was one of the things also that I that I learned in doing this research was that the spacecraft was evolving constantly, and because of the launch rates being so rapid, what was frequently happening is you would have a vehicle being rolled out to the pad for a mission while the, the previous mission had not even gotten to its objective yet. For example, Apollo 10 was launched, I believe, on May 2nd. And two days later, Apollo 11 was rolled out to the launch pad. And Apollo 10 hadn't even gotten to the moon yet. And so what was learned from Apollo 10 by the time it came back had to be incorporated. The changes had to be incorporated in the spacecraft while it was sitting out of the launch pad. So that's one of the consequences of the high turnaround. There were not as many changes to the, uh, to the launch vehicle. There were a few accidents and near misses with the launch vehicle. But it, it, by and large, was much more stable in the configuration than the spacecraft. Uh, here's a, an engine replacing uh, engine replacement unit for the, uh, the, the F1 engine. Uh, they could theoretically drive up underneath the, uh, the mobile launcher and, and pull an engine and stick a new one in on the first stage. Uh, they actually only did that in one one circumstance. Apollo 8, they, uh, they failed uh, one of the fuel pumps failed during testing at the uh, uh, at the Cape, and so they replaced the engine. That was the only that Apollo 8 was the only rocket. That, that flew without a, uh, a group of uh, engines that had been tested as an entire unit before. Uh, this is um, inside the engine department. Of, uh, these are the F-1 engines covered with, uh, with um, asbestos batting. They put asbestos and Inconel around that, that was added at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, the VAB and also tightened up at the launch pad. It took about 1,100 hours to install this batting around the engines to insulate them. Uh, they were they were tied on, basically threaded on with Inconel wire, which was, uh, I understand, a very uh, painful job for people to cut their hands up a lot and very time uh, Here is uh, the Apollo 14 spacecraft in the middle arriving. There were two boilerplates that were used uh, with the various launch vehicles until they got the actual spacecraft in. You can see that it's covered with a shroud and stayed on it until it got out of the launch pad. Uh, one of the things I learned about that I had not heard about before, and I guess Rockwell was not real happy about publicizing, was that this, the S2 stage, the second stage of the uh, of the Saturn V uh, for Apollo 4 and Apollo 6, uh, failed during some of the some of the modifications and testing. And so, rather than have it delay the checkout of the rest of the vehicle, Rockwell constructed what they called a spacer, or which was derogatorily called a spool because it looks kind of like a spool here. But this, this is the same exterior dimensions as the S2 stage of the vehicle, same length, 
and they get this pass wire. So here it is actually stacked on the Saturn V. Uh, they use that as a, as a placeholder, stack the, the uh, third stage on top of it until the S2 stage is actually ready, then they unstack everything and put it back in. Uh, so this was, a, this was a source of embarrassment for Rockwell, uh, getting ripped about what a beautiful vehicle it was. <laughs> but again, part of, part of what happened from having to do things so, so quickly, the S1 stage, S1C stage was the heaviest by far. It was farthest along in the development process. The S4B stage, the third stage, was also going along in the, in the development process, but getting heavier and heavier. And they had to shave weight off the vehicle. And so the only the only slack left came out of the S2 stage. And there was a lot of modification that had to be done. For example, the shared bulkhead between the uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tanks was, a, was an innovation to help reduce the weight of the S2 stage. <coughs> Here's an actual S2 stage being, uh, being mated now. And the uh, third stage coming in. So you guys uh, standing around inside the instrument unit. These are uh, IBM guys, I believe, oh, yeah, waiting, for it, waiting for the instrument unit to come in. Uh, the IBM guy said that it was, it was hard to find mechanical, uh, uh, mechanical technicians for IBM. Most of the guys at that stage were all the white, uh, white shirt uh, programmer types. And, so that having to actually pull the stages together with something that's new for IBM. Uh, here's the lunar module coming in. You can see it's still wrapped in plastic. Uh, I, I like this picture too because you can see the work platforms that are up inside the, uh, the adapter inside the fairing there that stayed in up until just uh, before the end of the work as the uh, final countdown is beginning. Uh, this is uh, astronaut Ron Evans is the, uh, the gentleman on the left. Standing, this is inside the uh, interstage between the second stage and the third stage, talking with McDonald Douglas technician. So there was plenty of room to move around inside the vehicle, as I'm sure there will be inside the SLS. Um, here's a gentleman doing a stage separation simulation test. It's part of one of the electrical tests that they did on the vehicle, as well as the DAB. He's got the, all the electrical connections between the two vehicles passing through this device. When the time comes in the countdown test, it pushes a button and it breaks the connections and they check to see if the stages will continue to function when they're electrically isolated from each other. Uh, this is one of the more unusual tests. And this is uh, this is being done on the uh, facilities vehicle. Uh, yeah, this is the CT test. You haven't seen this before here. I, I had a lot of different people try to explain to me what was going on with this test here. Uh, one of them said they were interested in finding out the mechanical bending constant of the vehicle. But I think what's actually happening is that they're testing out the, uh, the, the dampening system that's attached to the third stage. Uh, and I think they're just seeing how, how much they can get the vehicle to vibrate. That's the dampening system on the right there. The, the red. <laughs> <laughs> Get their steps. It looks like a lot. There's all kinds of legends around this. Somebody said that the escape tower fell off. You know, that's not. That wasn't a DJ. No. The damper is doing its job. It's, it's slowing you down, but the, there's still an awful lot of movement uh, in the spacecraft here. <laughs> So again, if you're thinking you've got this, this large vehicle, when it gets out of the launch pad, it's going to be subject to a lot of pain. <laughs> so what they actually did was then to, uh, they redesigned the damping system. And now it's the thing that's across the, uh, the top here was attached to the escape tower. And that actually kept the movement down a lot more than attaching a big lamp to the vehicle did. They said that the uh, goal was to try to keep the top of the escape tower moving by no more than the diameter of a basketball during the high winds of the day so here's Apollo 11 rolling up to the launch pad. Uh, one structure that you don't have, I don't believe there's an analog to in the SLS, is the mobile service structure, which is the large uh, entry thing on the monstrosity on the right hand side here. It was built to, to service the spacecraft. You see there, that around the upper uh, areas there, there's a couple of cocooning types of enclosures that enclose the spacecraft up there. Uh, there was an open elevator ride going up there. They said it was one of the scariest things you'd ever want to do because the elevator was, was prone to breaking down halfway up to the doors opening to 300 feet down. And there was nothing going on there. There's a lot of people just kind of like sat on the floor and held on. When they were <laughs> there was also a man race system, which, which purportedly people occasionally, one of those things where you jump on yeah. and then it, it 
stand on a, on a thing that lifts you up to the top of it, turn with that, <coughs> all of a sudden, and it's going to collapse. Uh, that didn't go all the way, but thought this would get you to the mobile launcher level. But you know, it's a huge piece of machinery. That weight, that that mobile service structure weighed as much as the uh, launch tower, the launcher, and the Saturn V are um, uh, So it was it was really big. They had to counterweight it to keep it from falling over. Um, there are very few pictures of that. I was really surprised in doing the research. It's hard to find pictures of the inside of it. Here you can see a little bit of some of the uh, the work area inside of it as it's pulling away from the, uh, the spacecraft. Uh, here's another picture of the inside of it. There's a lot of, you can see the flex hoses uh, all over the, over the top here. That's the loading hyperballs into the uh, command service module and the lunar module. Here they're replacing the uh, piece of the oxygen tanks on Apollo 14. They're replacing these after the Apollo 13 accident. So again, this was being done out at the launch pad. After, after the Apollo 13 explosion, the tanks were redesigned and then replaced uh, with one of the vehicles out of the launch pad. Mm. Loading the, uh, loading the, the uh, the hyperballs was a very slow process. Uh, one of the guys drew a cartoon about this. They basically shut the pad down for a week while they were loading the hyperballs on the uh, on the command and service module and the blue module because it was such a slow process. They said it was basically like pouring in bucket loads at a time, um, as opposed to being able to dump in tens of thousands of gallons of blocks in the LH2 and in the, uh, the launch field. So this is uh, to give you just a little bit of a, of a view of what, it's, what it was like inside that, that uh, carrying adapter there. There were work platforms all around. They had uh, what were called cookie cutters installed around the inside of that. That if something was, uh, there was an emergency, you hit a button and it hydraulically blew a hole in the side of the, of the cork fairing there that you could then jump out of. You had to be specially certified to operate that. Uh, there was actually plutonium aboard uh, several of the lunar modules. This is a plutonium cask that was on the side of, uh, of one of the lunar modules that had to be specially cooled down uh, up until just before countdown. That powered the experiments when they got to, got to the moon of the later Apollo missions. One of the interesting changes that I, I heard that happened out of the launch pad, again, these are kind of things that, because of the, of the rush to get things done, um, this was an interesting story. Was that the original way that the the, leg, the landing legs of the Apollo lunar module were designed? There was a look. There was some foil. Then it was bare metal at the, the bottom part of the leg and most of the of the landing pad. That was what the intent was when the lunar module came down. There were these probes that stuck down from the bottom of it. When it was about ten feet above the ground, those probes would contact the lunar surface and then they'd shut off the engine and they they fall the last ten feet. Well, the astronauts on Apollo 11 decided they didn't like that. And Apollo 10 was already out of the launch pad, actually, already gone out. So they were thinking, what can we do? We want, to, we want to be able to land all the way down before we shut off the engine. We want to have an option of not cutting out the engine until we're absolutely sure on the ground. Well, they hadn't certified to see if the, if the bare metal could handle the extra heat being deflected from the ground from the, the uh, descent engine of the module. So they were going to have to add insulation. Okay, so we're going to add insulation, and that's going to add 39 pounds of weight, and it takes uh, you know 400 pounds of fuel to get 100 pound or get one pound of weight to the moon. Um, and also, now you're adding this insulation to the lower leg here. How do we know this is not going to somehow bind and and keep legs from deploying appropriately? Okay, so Apollo 11 is already out of the launch pad. If we pull it back now, it's going to impact the schedule. We're going to miss the July launch date. Luckily, they had Apollo 12 still in the in the processing phase, still in the uh, the operations and checkout building. They were able to try that that insulation on Apollo 12 and make sure that it didn't interfere with anything. Got that certified, and then did a rush job on the lunar module out at uh, the launch pad less than a month before launch. Uh, this is the engineer or the technician that actually told me about this, and here he is standing next to one of the bare legs that he went through it. Uh, he said some guy was out there with a Polaroid camera and said, hey kid, you want a picture of yourself? So he got a picture of himself inside the, uh, the <coughs> module adapter there. Uh, he added the insulation to the legs, everything went fine. Here is, here is the now, now insulated leg on Apollo 11. Uh, another thing that was done at the launch pad is installing the plaque. It's between the hands of the gentleman at the top there. The plaque, the plaque would say, you know, we came in peace for all mankind. Uh, this, this was added usually within, uh, once the final countdown had started, within the last couple of days before launch. They got inside there, lying on their sides on the, on the, uh, on 
the work platforms install it way over the project. Uh, another the last minute change, uh, this was one of the Skylab missions. They discovered cracks in the uh, in the, in the uh, fins for for some of the uh, uh, this was an S1B, so there were eight fins on the uh, on this stage. They found cracks in some of them, and the, and the, the fins are actually supporting the weight of the vehicle on the hold down arm. So they had to replace all eight fins while it was at the launch pad less than a week before launch, which was uh, again an interesting engineering challenge to go about doing that. Uh, just a couple pictures of what life is like out there too. Here's a, a, a guy sitting on top of the white road uh, at night. Uh, this was in January of 1970. They said it was pretty pretty darn cold up there uh, in January. I, hey, this is uh, the same same kind of picture. <laughs> I guess it's good. This guy had fog there. And, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the escape system of the launch pad here. You'll see this, this uh, diagonal thing coming down to the left. There was a, a, an escape tunnel built into the, uh, the launcher in the Apollo era, and it went down through the launch pad to what they call the rubber room. And this is the actual rubber room here. Uh, I, I got a chance to look at it a couple of years ago. Uh, this ramp is actually made out of rubber. It comes down from the sh from the uh, the launcher. They they would flood it with water. The idea is that you got down into the middle of the launcher, jumped into there onto this Teflon pad, and, and got down to the bottom of it, uh, the concrete in the bottom of the launch pad as quickly as possible. Uh, this is the ramp here. It's kind of hard to see. The first time they tested it out, the guy went so fast. Once they added the water to it, he was sitting on Teflon. The guy hit the far end of the wall and broke it leg in nine places. <laughs> but assuming they survived the trip down the ramp, he ran around and went through a, it was equivalent of like a, a silo blast door into this uh, this room which was shock mounted. It could hold 24 workers at the launch pad. There was food in there for a day. There was a communication system in there and a high tech toilet. <laughs> you could basically ride out an explosion or a fuel uh, whatever was going on, some sort of catastrophe on the launch pad, you could ride out down there. And then uh, when it was safe, you could crawl out through this, or walk out through this uh, ventilation tunnel under the perimeter of the head. Um, that was, uh, you, got, you had to get rubber ring certified if, the if you were going to be on the red cruise that serviced the vehicle out there at the launch pad. So everybody that went through um, having to work on the red cruise when the vehicle was, was sealed up had to go through the certification process. Uh, they, they came up with a more, realizing that actually riding the elevator down through whatever conflagration was going on on the launch pad was probably not a good idea, so they came up with an escape system at the top. They tested it first with dummies hanging from T-bars, and uh, one of the engineers was telling me about uh, that they had hooked up a, a, a slide wire from the top of the DAB down to the ground. And so I used to go to work there in, in E-Tower of the DAB, and I would see this guy with a big laundry thing full of dummies. And they were going up and you know, watching them off the top of the TV. As the week went on, he said those, those dummies were missing heads and arms. And legs. So they hooked up. They never had to actually ride that system. And so they, they did uh, come up with a slide wire system, which was some kind of adopted for the uh, adapter for the space show as well. I, they only tested this with, with people one time that I'm aware of. Uh, another accident at the launch pad. Um, this was on Apollo 13. Apollo 13 was not a lucky mission by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, as they were going through the countdown demonstration test uh, with the vehicle fully fueled at night, uh, some officers were driving the security cars around the perimeter, uh, parked over near the liquid oxygen facility in what appeared to be just an area of fog. It turned out to be pure oxygen vapor from uh, really boiling off from there. And so when, when, when the uh, security officers turned on his ignition, he said he watched this the uh, piston shoot through the uh, foot of his uh, car. It set three of the vehicles on fire. They all exploded and burned. The people were able to get out safely, luckily. But you can see here, this melt of the vehicles. Um, people were, uh, were of course, <coughs> reading it, saying that, uh, you know, why is it that we all have to carpool and, and our security guys have cars to burn? <laughs> Uh, lightning was another big, uh, another big issue. They did not have the, the lightning arrestors that they had. This, the, you know, they did have a, a lightning tower attached to the top of the lot. Here's one taking a, about 120,000 amp hit on Apollo 15. Uh, one of the hits burned the top, the top meter off of one of the lightning arrestors. The top, top 30 feet. <coughs> so, uh, 
Uh, they had mag links up on top that they were supposed to go up and retrieve after every lightning hit to see the intensity of the, of the pit between. Um, that was supposed to be a very fun experience because in a lot of cases they had to go up, and in several cases had to go up and get back during the course of the countdown while there was still lightning in the area to go up and get a mag link up on top of the <laughs> There were mag links also on top of the mobile service structure on the right, but they were considered to be so uh, hazardous to get to that they actually sat there for several years before anybody ever got to it. I wanted to talk a little bit about computers. You know, I'm running short of time here. Uh, the computers at the Cape were remnants, <laughs> as the saying goes. Here's, here's some boards. I'll pass these around if anybody's interested in taking a look at a couple boards here. from. The RCA 110A computer, this is a, a, a four, or excuse me, an eight-bit flip-flop. It's got eight transistors on it. Uh, the, there were 3,500 boards that made up every computer. There was one computer in every firing room, one computer in every mobile launcher. Uh, when they first started using the computers, the things were breaking down every couple of hours, and they were unable, they would pull what they thought was a defective card, send it off to RCA for analysis, and then not, not be able to find out what was going on. And it turned out, that you'll see as it comes around, there's a coating on this. The coating was actually shrinking and causing the transistor leads to push through the bottom of the uh, cards. The, the transistor leads were cracking when it was hot. And as soon as it cooled off, everything expanded back up again, and, the, and there appeared not to be a break. But uh, you can imagine there were 15,000 transistor leads that were going through heating and cooling every time they turned the computer on or off. And trying to, having to, to troubleshoot that was a uh, major pain, but they, they did get the computer working. Uh, this is magnetic core memory that was used. It's a 256-bit uh, uh, memory board there. And this is a uh, this is a 2K memory nest. It's about eight inches on the side. They had 32K of memory in each of the computers uh, that was used for ground testing. But it did, it did the work they needed it to do. It could process about 2,000 different uh, discrete inputs and outputs. It's controlled uh, by one of these lovely uh, computer keyboards. They had 10 of these scattered throughout the firing room. Um, and here's, here's what the firing room looked like in the Apollo era. There were about 450 different console positions. Um, you got the brass sitting down here at the bottom and these, these four rows. That's the elevated the stair stepped up to the windows are down here. The main floor had uh, the stage engineers, and then the back, the, all the uh, the top half of it is measurement racks and uh, uh, strip charts and things like that. Um, so here's the brass. You have the, the senior management sitting here. Um, one of the innovations that that people required in order to be able to use the computer, the engineers did not trust the computer. They did not want to have everything under uh, under control of the computer because it was so big. So prone to breaking down. So as a compromise, we came up with this. You'll see the switch here saying on, auto, and off. Uh, the engineer, if, if everything was being run by the computer, the switch was in the auto position. You would leave it there. That's where you were supposed to leave it. If anything happened and the engineer monitoring the test didn't like what was going on, he could immediately hit the switch up you know, to turn it on or turn it off or something went wrong. That would immediately halt the computer program, but it would render the, the vehicle in whatever, whatever condition was being used. So you had all of these manual um, potential for input. And as the program went on, people got more and more comfortable with, with that. And, and eventually, um, there was so much more additional uh, computer control by Apollo 17 that I think it was an extra several hours of hold time that was allowed because just for catch up because things no longer had to be done very well. But uh, the, the uh, computers drove these relay modules. Uh, this is a module of eight different relays. It's the same one that's in the picture here. There were 750 of these about in the uh, mobile launcher. They basically controlled the wiring that went to control the vehicle or the launch complex. So you had, instead of a computer controlled uh, thing, you had a lot of relay logic that, that uh, uh, commanded how the vehicle was going to work. You see they had a lot of uh, a lot of cables coming in, a lot of wires going out, and it was uh, this was what configuration control looked like. Rather than rewiring the cables, it was all done through patches, kind of a holdover from the uh, telephone days, the, the early telephone switchboard days. So I, I just imagine what that's like. Uh, you know, something like that. But the, uh, the the control panels themselves are a real piece of beauty, uh, and any changes that were done in configuration were done 
through this kind of patch panel. This is this is one from firing room three. Actually, this is a bone <coughs> control panel. Um, and you can see the back of it here is just really, really lovely wiring. There, there's no brains in this whatsoever. It's just <laughs> the basic wires going out to a couple 61 pin connectors that go to the launch computer in the back, the back end, the distributor racks. But then, so this would allow the guy, to, this was uh, this was for the first stage lock stone, uh, or locks from control, control and purge. There were, again, hundreds of these dedicated panels. Every one of these had a dedicated function to it. And so rather than having a computer <coughs> console that you could call to do various things, you had individual engineers who were stationed at each of these individual consoles having a dedicated function. Feel free to come up and take a look at this one. <coughs> so here's a, just a shot of the firing room in operation. This is the, during the uh, countdown demonstration test for Apollo 8. The Boeing engineer actually the mic this console is in the middle of this of the picture here. <laughs> it's that console would be on the right hand side, on the left hand side. So this is the, the S1C control area. Now we're looking scrolling over to the S2 stage control area. This is one of the computer control, uh, console controls that could call up individual programs, individual test programs. But most of these things, as you can see, just dedicated. Uh, there's another one of computer consoles. And this is just a, uh, a readout of all the various uh, 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 discrete inputs and outputs that are going on at the launch. Smoking's allowed in the, in the firing room. <laughs> Average age is about 25 to 28 for a lot of the engineers that are working there. And uh, as you saw, most of them, most of them were men. Uh, here's a page from the Apollo 11 countdown manual. Again, everybody who's on, on the net listening for their call outs. Uh, when the time came in the launch, uh, when you got down to T minus three minutes and 30 seconds, the Boeing engineer sitting at the S1C sequence command would arm the sequencer, push the firing command button on the far right hand here, slide his hand down the rail. Well, actually, hold that firing command button down until the computer acknowledged that he had pushed that button down. Slide his hand down the rail over the cutoff button there and, and keep his thumb right over that. He was one of two or three people in the firing room that could cut off the, uh, uh, the, the countdown up to the point of ignition if anything went wrong. Uh, this was the sequencer it was, that was out in the launch, uh, the uh, mobile launcher. It's, it's a solid state device. You see patches, patch things at the top of gate, it gave outputs every tenth of a second every hundredth of a second. Uh, that controlled the final three minutes of, of the countdown was done through this sequencer, just giving outputs that then controlled various parts of the relay logic. And uh, as they went through and, ch and checked uh, various interlocks to make sure that things could go up on time. Uh, they like things simple. Uh, I, this was I thought, I thought an example of one of the kind of uh, simple things to do rather than, than coming up with an automated process. This is one of the hold down arms that you'll see the arrow pointing to, one of the hold down arms that's holding down the vehicle up until the point of liftoff. There's a hood over that that's got to protect the mechanism from the intense heat of the engines that are going by. You'll see this lanyard that's connecting the hood to the side of the vehicle. Um, here's the Apollo 11 launch. And uh, the uh, hold down arm is in the middle here between, there's two, you'll see two uh, tail service masts that are going to swing up. This is in slow motion, obviously. Okay, so here's the hold down arm. You can see that cable connecting it. As the vehicle rises, it pulls the cable, which causes the hood to fall forward <laughs> and cover the, cover the mechanism just in time. So nothing complicated, simple works. Really? <coughs> So again, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of any of those cables failing, but uh, it's just an interesting, uh, interesting process. So here's the firing room. This is right after the Apollo 11 launch, and I do want to point out there was one woman in the firing room there. <laughs> <laughs> she was the first engineer to work in one of the controls. They didn't even have ladies' rooms on the uh, on the third floor of the LCC where they, where the firing rooms were. So hopefully everything goes off well. You've got a launch. Sometimes things don't go as well. This was during the Apollo 17 when the uh, sequencer failed to issue uh, one of the commands to pressurize the, the, uh, 
liquid oxygen tank at the fourth stage I, 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 at uh, one of the uh, McDonald Douglas engineers realized that it hadn't issued the command. He reached over and manually engaged it, but because the sequencer hadn't had realized, or because the logic realized the sequencer hadn't issued that command, it shut down the, the countdown at T minus 30 seconds. So they recycled uh, at the launch pad, tried to decide what to do. Boeing wanted to, to, to stop right to stop the launch right away because the uh, computer system again was still not uh, highly reliable, and some of the uh, uh, previous tests with the with the uh, early versions of the computer system. At one point, when the uh, the uh, computer shut down, it issued half of the discrete commands at one time. Just basically did a complete dump. It caused all of these things. So but they were afraid. They had an un unknown condition here with the sequencer. They didn't know what had gone on. Uh, Marshall was was uh, duplicating everything that had gone on after the se sequencer. They figured it was a faulty diode. They worked. Uh, they did a jump around, a, a jumper workaround for it, and recycled. And a couple hours later, we're able to launch a policy. Um, this was one other mission I wanted to talk about. This is Skylab. The, um, the workshop is being stacked in the uh, forward left hand side. The first uh, manned vehicle for for uh, the crew is in the back there. Both of these vehicles had problems. Uh, uh, most of you are probably aware of what happened with Skylab during the launch. Uh, that there was a uh, um, when there was uh, air got into the uh, uh, shielding and, and caused part of the, uh, the outer shield to fall off, which mm -hmm. tore off one of the wings, which cut off, um, actually cut off some of the primal cord that was separating the interstages. And so the, it, it carried an interstage into orbit that it wasn't designed to carry into orbit. Um, luckily, they were bad on performance that day. The, the first crew that was going to go up there and service them, this was something I had not known until we did the research for this book that there was a, uh, a sneak circuit that happened during the course of the, the launch that nobody even knew about until the day after the launch had happened. This is, uh, this is one of the, type, uh, one of the uh, scientific data system printers that gives you the status of what's going on during the course of, uh, of, a, of a launch. It's monitoring the uh, state of various discretes. And, and so the printout you would get would be on the left half of this, just the numbers. When going through and analyzing that, they found out that a sneak circuit as the vehicle had started moving, a relay had recontacted, which which caused a launch failure signal to be sent back to the vehicle, which attempted to put it back on external power again. And luckily, that connection had just broken. If it had gotten through there, it would have shut down all the internal power on the vehicle with the engines running. Uh, there was no electrical power needed to run the engine, so you would have had an uncontrolled vehicle taken out flying. Uh, due to a sneak circuit. Again, they didn't realize it, so I went back and analyzed this the next day. So one of the guys looked at the print and said, are you going to go tell the launch director about this? <laughs> and uh, luckily they were able to, to fix it for the next time around. But again, uh, no real-time feedback on what was going on with it. It could have been a real catastrophe. For that. <clears throat> but uh, luckily, you know, most of the, most of the engine, uh, even the, the failures were successful failures with the Saturn V. And again, I think it's just, it's remarkable what people can do when they put their heads together and united around a common goal. I'm really excited to see SLS almost ready to get off the ground now, and I, I, I'm excited for you guys. I know it's a, it's a lot of work talking to some of the guys at the Cape, so that they've never been, they never realized how busy standing up a new program was, uh, because the shuttle had gone on for so long, and now they're getting a new program ready so they had no feel for how busy that, that it was going to be to get this ready. Fly. I'm really looking forward to that first launch. I never got to see a Saturn V launch. I'm going to be there for SLS. <laughs> so I wanted to, I know I just kind of like zoomed through this, but I wanted to open it up for questions here. By the way, uh, uh, this is this is me with the launch. That's my firing ring, in fact. <laughs> so I wanted to open it up for questions or uh, comments or other things for you. Where would we buy your book? Uh, it's available on Amazon. I've got my business card with me. If you want to thumb through it, I've got a couple of copies of it here too. But, uh, it started off as, as researching the, the processing flow, and then the, the publisher asked me to buy it too. So, uh, but it, it is on Amazon.com. It's both an ebook and a hard. Are these slides still available? You mentioned several times. It's the only picture you know of. Yeah, and, and we, we yep. will make we'll make the uh, some of these are in the book as well. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the from the remote community? Well, again, you know, feel free when you're when we're done, come up here, uh, 
play on the, on the, I don't think you can break this thing. <laughs> so I've got one for you. Um, what surprised you most in all your research? What was the most shocking thing that you found? Was it the sneak circuit or like the RP leak and the tank dimple that they had? Or Yeah, I mean, that's, there were a number of things like that that, that just never made the, uh, the news. I, mean, I didn't realize how close Apollo 11 was to not making it on a couple of occasions. There was, uh, one of the books talks about, um, there was an incident that, that uh, McDonnell Douglas engineer went into the bathroom on the on the uh, in the VAB and saw written on a note on there it said, "I fixed the, bo the booster. You'll never fight it." Ha ha ha. And so there was immediately the FBI was called in with the sabotage going on, whatever, and uh, uh, they did an investigation. It turned out what had happened was one of the one of the one of the fairly high guys up in McDonnell Douglas's people on site there had gone out for a three martini lunch from a guy with a guy from uh, California, and they gotten a little, a little tipsy and, and thought they left us as a joke and then somebody saw it and reported it before they got a chance to take it down and so the guy was fired. <laughs> later on, later on, later on, later on, and this was this was something that I don't think that the guy was, was hesitant about telling me about, but I'm glad it got in his book too. He said that on the way to the moon the, the S4B stage experienced some severe shaking so much that, that Tom Stafford was thinking about aborting the, uh, the transliter injection uh, they, the, the vehicle was shaking so hard they actually thought he was going to make it. He thought, well, I'm going to die one way or the other. I might as well just ride it out. So immediately they went back and pulled, pulled some of the control boxes from the S4Bs that were out in, at Huntington Beach and they found cold solder joints in the control boxes for every one of them they looked at out there. And I thought, geez, if it's on that one, it's on the Apollo 11 one. So they had the, the chief QA guy, one guy from NASA, pulled the box, put them in a room together, told everybody else to get out. They opened it up and they looked at the thing and the guy says, does that look like a cold solder joint? He goes, I don't know, I can't tell. And one guy said, I, I say, what, if I pull on it with this, if I pull on it with these wire tires here and it, and it, and it doesn't move, it'll probably be good. You think so? And if I do that, will you buy off? And the guy said, I guess so. <laughs> so they, they did it and it turned out to be fine. But he, they were not able to tell. But, you know, if they pulled it, they would have, they would have missed the opposite of the landing date. Yeah. yeah. So, kind of following up on what you just said, can you, from your research, can you talk about like risk tolerance for this in this program and how design changes were made? And it seemed like the pace was very high. You know, yeah. they they had a lanyard closing a, you know, a, a protective cover. You know, just things like that in compare it to kind of how that's evolved over over time with the shuttle program and. Delta now in SLS. Yeah, and you know, I, I think I think a lot of it. You know, they were doing a lot. They were doing so many of these test flights that you had the opportunity to, to, to check things out. I mean, one of the things that Von Braun was was um, was known for was he liked to do you know incremental testing, one stage at a time. And he was going to. It was probably going to take thirty to fifty launches for him to feel comfortable putting somebody on top of the on top of the Saturn V. And George Mueller, who was, or George Miller, who was the head of the. Uh, Apollo program said, look, we've got to do all up tests and we've got to test all the stages at one time or else we'll never make the, the 1969 deadline. And so he got Von Braun to, to buy off on the idea that they would test that vehicle full up rather than testing each individual stage. So I think there's an example of, of, of calculated risk. Uh, you know, if you talk to the astronauts who were involved in this, they said they realized, you know, the Apollo 8 guys said they figured they had a 33% chance of being successful, a 33% chance of most of the mission objectives being met, and a 33% chance of not making it back at all. And they were willing to accept that risk because that was part of what had to happen. You know, I think after, I was surprised even after the Apollo 1 fire that people thought it was going to be the end of the uh, space program, but people instead picked up the pace and kept going from that. You know, it, I think if you had a Challenger type disaster, even though NASA said it, and the astronauts would have gone with it, if you had a a crew die in space like on Apollo 13, I think it probably would have ended the program. Uh, as it was, I think a lot of the people in Houston didn't want uh, didn't want us to continue flying after Apollo 13. They thought we were pushing our rock. So I think the risk tolerance, even th even then, there was a, a, a wide range of risk tolerance. Yeah, I, I, quality control and everything, of course, was extremely important then. Everything was stamped off and checks were done. I don't want to say that things were half haphazardly rushed. But I do think that because of the rapid pace, you had opportunity to learn, which, you, which I, I guess is one of my concerns if you have a long time between launches, you know, that, that you lose uh, keeping, the, keeping the, the team focused. 
you know, uh, and, and watching out for things. And you also, I think, just kind of lose that sharpness of, of, of having uh, that challenge constantly in front of you. Thank you. Good. My my next book is about is it's going to be on the uh, spatial Columbia disaster, the a, the aftermath of that. I'm working with Mike Leinbach, who is the uh, the launch director at the Columbia. Again, we're going to be talking a lot about the risk. We can give Jonathan a round of applause. Thanks for coming out.